The first time I went out on the Gulf of Mexico after the BP oil spill was in early May of 2010. With colleagues and new acquaintances, we were headed out to the Chandelier Islands with a fishing boat captain who was interested in seeing how his favorite fishing grounds had fared after the spill. We left from a small town called Venice and were quickly soaked to the bone in the rocky water, passing land shrunk into small islands post-Hurricane Katrina, shrimp trawlers that were turned into oil skimming vessels, and tall pipelines and platforms rising out of the Gulf that were reminiscent of a dystopian science fiction future. We came around to the western side of the island chain and the water started to calm and we took a moment to observe what was around us. Rainbowed water lapping against the vessel and clay-colored clumps, Louisiana sweet crude oil. Taking a moment to observe what was in the atmosphere, we started to feel slightly dizzy from the heat, the fumes, and the small waves. And we took a moment to, to take it all in, watching as helicopters landed on the island chain, startling an already traumatized flock of pelicans into flight. Our goal that day was to extend our view, though, from the boat. So what we did was we sent five and a half foot helium-filled balloons that were tethered with a very simple point-and-shoot camera up about 1,500 feet in the air, effectively capturing the spill from above. Bringing the images back down that day showed us a very different perspective um, from what we were seeing within the boat. The rainbowed water that we had seen lapping against the vessel was now extended miles in either direction. And we saw some of the most devastating images we could have imagined of a disaster that continued to unfold. From moments like this, um, these became indications of what now guides my work. During the BP spill, I began to recognize that there was people all around me who wanted to ask questions about places they cared about using tools and methods that they could take out into their own world. I also recognize that we have the right to be able to be involved in the scientific processes that are happening and the research processes that are happening, bringing us to higher levels of consciousness and giving us the ability to be involved in the management of our communities. So what we've come to use is a process that we call community science. During this process, community-led investigation and exploration of the world is driven by community-defined questions. It allows people involvement in the entirety of the scientific process. It may or may not involve professional scientists, but it always focuses on the people who are driving the questions, owning the data, and being able to understand the processes that they're engaging in. Community science is a form of activism. It's one in which people start by asking questions, by wondering something about their world. They think through the best tools and methods that they can use. They go out and they collect data and information, they do analysis, they interpret it, and then they figure out how it can best serve the outcomes um, that they've indicated. So during the spill, uh, we worked with around 200 people, Gulf Coast residents, students, NGO volunteers, and we walked hundreds of miles of the coastline of the Gulf. We took to kayaks, uh, we rode on airboats, capturing the imagery that would allow us to give witness and have an active voice in the events unfolding around us. By capturing these almost 200,000 images, we were giving an alternative narrative, one that was shaped by residents of the Gulf Coast, that allowed us to say we're not going to just listen to the corporation that jumped into the Gulf and then was allowed to lead the cleanup efforts as well. Environmental and public health disasters obviously, do not just happen in the Gulf Coast. They're both long-term, uh, taking years to correlate and build cases around, and short and rapid moving, um, such as in the seemingly weekly oil spills in producing, refining, and transport regions like the Niger Delta. In 2010, um, we were a kind of nascent community organized around a, a listserv that was called Grassroots Mapping. And during this time, um, we started bringing our ideas out into a, a broader audience, into a more public place. And we formed Public Lab as a nonprofit and an open community. The goal of Public Lab is to provide methods and tools for people that want to go out into their own world and ask questions, to understand the processes directly affecting them and happening around them, and to be engaged in knowledge production. 
So in the landscape that we work in with community science, um, what we see in terms of projects are widespread, but the questions are almost always coming from directly within the communities that are producing information. So questions such as, uh, what are those extra plants in my waterway that I'm seeing? Or why do I smell sulfur or sweet almonds in the air that I'm breathing? Are the types of questions that will then propel community science-driven projects. The majority of the times, they're not formed hand in hand with professional scientists, but they rely on the lived and learned experiences of people who interact every single day in the environs that they care about. For instance, in Lebanon, Youth in a Palestinian refugee camp are collecting aerial images in coordination with the local camp committee to create the first map by and for the camp. The local camp committee hopes to use these images to figure out the best ways to maintain infrastructure and to build out the common areas within the refugee camp. The added layer of local knowledge that the youth in the camp provides by telling stories um, provides an additional layer of visibility for the people of the camp. In a very different situation where different data is needed, in Tonawanda, New York, residents use buckets with bags and small vacuums to collect air samples through the Clean Air Coalition. The air samples that they collected indicated that there was additional research that was needed because of the quality of the air. Working with state regulators and the United States Environmental Protection Agency, they were able to successfully sue Tonawanda Coke Corporation under the Clean Air Act. Communities cannot adequately be supported by technology unless it's appropriate and situated in a context where organizing can be directly aligned. We're in a really exciting place where people are tying together the concepts of making with grassroots organizing. For instance, in Public Lab, we think about the, the concept of critical making um, and how we can teach people and allow people to learn through the process of putting together the objects that they're going to use to monitor their environment. There's inherent power in using science and data in the communications that we seek. There are tools such as open hardware Geiger counters, uh, 3D printed microscopes that are heralding in a new era in which scientific equipment is not just accessible to lab scientists, but also to people who want to go out into their world and, and ask similar questions, and who want to own and understand the processes affecting the places that they understand the most. Science has always belonged to the public. It is a public right for people to be able to engage in the questions that are driving research, and to be actively involved in making management-related decisions. I encourage scientists and others to think about ways that they can use open and community science practices in the work that they're doing to create higher levels of awareness and engagement with the public. I also encourage people to think about creating spaces like Public Lab that bring together people with specific expertises in the sciences and otherwise, and also learned and lived experiences to create better collaborations. In Public Lab, for instance, we work in a couple of different ways. So we create a virtual online portal where people are able um, to openly post dynamic uh, iterations and versions of tools and methods that contribute towards furthering research, creating activities which will uh, welcome newcomers into the processes of environmental monitoring, and also provide narrative stories around uh, the, the projects and work that people are doing. The second space is in person. Um, so we try to bring together people as much as possible so that they can pursue and further activist, technical, social, um, and scientific goals. But both of these, the core purpose is to really curate collisions that are going to help us to further innovation so that it thrives and to see communities flourish. So in creating these kinds of spaces, there's several simple questions that um, you can ask that can help you um, get to these places. What can I learn? What can I share? How can I ask questions and support the asking of questions that will allow for deeper and more meaningful engagement in the collaborations that we're creating? In the years that I've been doing this work, Open science practices have become central, technology, ubiquitous, and we're seeing a continued push to use technology around uh, grassroots organizing. This is all very exciting, um, but I hope that we can strive to continue to keep people at the center of what we're doing. If we're not able to do that, 
then we're going to see a myopic vision of the future, um, one that we sometimes see in our socio-technical systems right now, in which equity uh, in communities and equity between socioeconomic groups is further pushed apart. In a world in which I was taught to stand by and observe from afar, and I think many others were as well, during the BP oil spill, um, I became an agent of my own making. I became engaged, I became aware of what was happening around me in the world. And I encourage all of us in the work that we're doing as scientists and the other work in our daily lives to also consider those same experiences that can bring our knowledge, can bring our expertise back out into the public to help promote broader awareness. If we're able to create a movement in which science skills and technology promote civic involvement, and community-collected data is respected as a mode of information sharing, we'll be in a much better place to create cross-sectional partnerships um, amongst different groups. We'll also be able to address some of the most pressing local and global environmental issues of our times by being able to engage in things such as regulations, um, environmental agenda setting, and policy making. So, Imagine in your own community that you're starting to see seasonal weather patterns shift. It may be that you're seeing uh, rain that comes longer and comes down harder. It may be that you're seeing hotter days kind of flowing into the colder months of the year or that you're experiencing mass droughts. Now imagine if you were able to tell the story of what you were experiencing in your own community using data that you collected that you interpreted and you produced yourself. Then imagine if we were locally, after we were able to tell our own stories about how we're experiencing climate change, be able to tie that into a broader global narrative to discuss one of the most pressing environmental issues of our times. If we're able to equip people with the methods, the tools, the data to tell these stories, we're going to be in a much better place about coming up with a global solution not only to solve what's happening in our immediate environments, but also in the broader context of our humanity. Thank you.